We are here on Daf Gimel Amit Beis, and we started the Mishnah, and we'll just review that part of the Mishnah that we've already covered, and that is that there are three stages in the collection of Chikolim, and the first stage is Hachraza, and that's on Rosh Chodesh Adar. The second stage is on the 15th of Adar, and here we take a little bit more of an active role than just achraza in getting the people to bring forward their contributions, their shkolim. But it's not yet totally aggressive. It's only benachas, and that's called shulchanos. And those are the money changes. And people came from chutz la'aretz, from many different countries, to bring their shkolim to Yerushalayim. And those monies had to be changed. They were on the international currency market, but they had to be changed into Chikolim. So there were Shulchanos, and the Shulchani was the money changer. And once the money changes were out there in the public arena, the message got out that it's getting closer to the end of the time for the Shikolim. And when actually is the end of the time for the Shikolim? When is the critical moment? That's stage number three, when Bez is going to take a more aggressive role. And that, the Mishnah says, is going to take place on the 25th of Adar. And last time we got together, we were trying to figure out what exactly is unique about that date. And what aggressive role does the Bezdin take in this already three, stage number three? It's past the 15th when the Shulchanos are out there. And the answer is the following. That the carbon Tumid, which is a carbon Tzibur, has to be taken, has to be purchased from the monies of the Trumas al which were collected in the Shkolim. And the carbon tamid of Rosh Chodesh Nisan would already have to be taken from this year's shkolim. The new shkolim in the Truman Salichka, not from last year's. And the month of Adar is 29 days. It's always a chaser, which means that Rosh Chodesh Nisan is always day 30 of Chodesh Adar. That's the in Rosh Hashanah has to do with the way they organize the calendar. Now, before a carbon is brought, it's not just enough to purchase the carbon and then immediately bring the carbon. You need four days of Bikur. So that if the Shkolem came in on the 25th of Adar, so we have, let's say, if we want to count backwards, I'm just going to do it that way. It's a little easier for me. So that by the time we get to the to the 29th, which is the last day of Hadar, we've already had four days of Bikur. So that would be the 29th, the 28th, the 27th, and the 26th. So the monies are collected on the 25th. The carbon is purchased on the 26th. On that day itself, we have day number one of Bikur. And then we invest, again, all this is to guarantee that the said, the lamb for the Carbon Tumid is not blemished. It has no moon. So we have the 26th, 27th, 28th, and 29th. Those will be the four days of Bikur so that we've already purchased this lamb from the new, this new year's Shkolem, and that lamb will be brought as the first Karman from the new Shkolem on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Now, in what way is Bezdin more aggressive when we get to this red line, so to speak, this is at the end of the row. We must get the Shkolem in by the 25th of Adar so that we can purchase the lamb on the 26th of Adar for the Talmud of Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And here we have a locha of Mimashkinim. And what we're going to see is that Mimashkinim could be understood well, let me, let me start from the beginning. First of all, 
is it true to say that A equals B, meaning whenever there's a chiyuv of shkolim, ipso facto, there's a din of a mashkin, where Bezin is going to take this active role, and if the person doesn't come forward to pay his obligation, then the Bezin will confiscate his property, his possession, in lieu of that chov. And we're going to try to develop a theory today that there are two different dinim. There's one din of chiyuv shkolim, and it's a separate din, which may or may not apply, called memashkinin. So you could theoretically be included in the chiyuv, but not in the din of memashkin. Now, in addition to that, we're going to create another bifurcation, another two din. There's going to be a din of chiyuv, and then there's going to be a din of what we call kiyuv that we will accept your shkolim, despite the fact that you're not obligated. So here are the various levels. You can have someone who's completely excluded from shkolim. He's not chayev, and even if he comes along and on his own volition, he wants to volunteer the shkolim, we won't accept it. Then we get to the next level. You're not chayev, but if you come forward, we will accept your shkolim. Then we get to the next level. You're chayev, but there's no mashkinin. And finally, we get to fourth level, which is the general rule, that you're chayev and bezdim emashkin. Now here, I want to present to you a very fundamental chakira of the minchas chinuch, about the nature of this din of emashkin. Where does it come from? One way of understanding it, as the minchas chinuch suggests, is it's a just simply an application of a universal principle called kofen ala mitzvahs. We will force a person to fulfill a mitzvah. And from that perspective, shekel is no different than any other mitzvah. If you're obligated, then we will force you if in event that you uh, are recalcitrant, you will refuse to come forward and fulfill your chiyu. Then the Mechaz suggests that this might be Mamashkinin on Shkolim might be a separate halacha in Shkolim that goes beyond the general principle, above and beyond the general principle of Kofin ala mitzvos. And that is because the nature of Shkolim is a chiv mama. And we have in Chochin Mitzvah, forget about Orachayim and Yoridea, in Chochin Mitzvah we have halachas that if a person is obligated in a financial debt, then if he doesn't pay that debt, there's something called Shibun. And we collect from Mishubodin, meaning there's a lien on a person's property. So if Ruvain borrows money from Shimon and Ruvain defaults on the loan, Shimon has recourse through the Bezdin, to collect from Ruvain's property. And the Minchas says that there's a tremendous nafkimina between these two definitions. Is it kofen ala mitzvahs, or is it midin shibudim on achiv mama? And the nafkimina is whether we need befanah. What does that mean? In kofen ala mitzvahs, we must have the person in front of us because our goal whether he likes it or not, is to get him, afford for him a kiyuma mitzvah. And that can only be done the fun of. If the man flew the coop and he's, you know, on vacation in Orlando and there's no kofen ala mitzvahs, he will not have a mitzvah if we just simply go into his living room and take the... Uh, you know, the uh, the lamp, uh, you know, that has a beautiful uh, shade on it and sell it on the market. That's not kofen ala mitzvahs. Masha Enkin, he says in the second definition, if we're dealing with a chiyuv mamon, then with regard to a malvin alove, govin afil shalom befan of shalove. Yeah, we're not learning kochen mitzvah now, but it's a complicated halach. The lova sometimes may have a taino, and he can say parati. But assuming he said parati, or, for example, they showed him the star in the hands of the Malva, and he was not makhish the star, 
which means that even if he said, Parati, I paid you up the chov, we still don't believe him because of the Malva is holding on to the star. In such a case, we can collect and confiscate the Nechosim of the Lova, Midin Shibudim, even Chalobafana, which means that he could be out there in the world. He's not even aware of the fact that Bezdin confiscates his Nechosim. The Minchaschina goes even further than this. He says that in the case of Kofanal and Mitzvahs, it's not necessarily that we have to go ahead and simply pick up, you know, his um, his couch and sell it on the market. We have to use this as a pressure tactic that he realizes that we are threatening, the president is threatening to start confiscating his property. He will come forward, therefore, and redeem his chov. He will pay up his chov in this case of Chikolim. If, on the other hand, it's a din of Shibudim, of Chiv Mamon, and Bezin is now empowered to collect his property, then this is not a pressure tactic. This is simply a way of getting the monies over to the person, or in this case, the institution, the Trumas Alishka, who has a right to collect that money. We're not dealing with a pressure tactic. So, for example, it could be that if it was only Kofanal and Mitzvah, Bezin would have to remain outside the house. They would not enter into his house and break down the door. They would simply threaten him. Look, my friend, you have two choices. Either you come forward and pay up your chov and give us the shkolen, or we're going to take your refrigerator. We'll take your couch. And hopefully he'll cough up the money. In the case of Shibudim, of a chovas mamon, that means that we're not out there waiting for him to open up the door. We'll break down the door if need be to collect from Chibudu. And the Menchaschinuch leaves this as an open question. What is the nature of Memashkinin when Bezdin will collect from the possessions of the person who refuses, you know, already past the 25th of Adar, and he hasn't yet coughed up his skull? I thought perhaps we could add another little embellishment to this Minchas Chinuch. What do you mean by a chiyuv mamon? I understand in the case of a malva and a lova or a mazik and a nizak, if I borrowed money, I damaged your properties, then I owe you mon- money. Your money is gabach. It's called mamoni gabach. But in this case, what does that mean? Shkolim, did I borrow a shekel from the from the Truma Salishka? I never I never obligated myself. Narvas, it's a mitzvah. So the chova is a chovas mitzvah. So therefore, I would like to just reformulate a little bit, you know, make a little change in the language of the Minchas Chinuch. I would suggest that the second side of the Minchas Chinuch is that when the nature of the mitzvah and the chova is to pay mamon, it generates a Shibud Nechassim. It's not that the mitzvah itself is irrelevant in the second side of the Minchaskin. Forget about the mitzvah. He owes an independent chov. There is no independent chov. He never borrowed money from the Trumas Alishka. The Trumas Alishka has no claim against him. Of us, the Torah said, Tarimu is Trumaschem. You have to bring your uh, Masa Shekel. And inherent in the Chiv of mitzvah, is a chiv mama because this mitzvah is unique in that it is a chiv mama. The chiv mitzvah generates a shibud nechosim. If for some reason at some point he becomes part of from the mitzvah, let's say he becomes a shote or something, then he would be at that point completely protected. From even a Shibud Mama, meaning the, the Shiva Nechasim, even according to the second side of the Mechaschin, is not some sort of independent Chiv Mama that exists on its own two feet. It's a Chiv Mama that was generated and came into existence as a result of the Chiv Mitzvah. But the Chiddush here is that if you have a Mitzvah, the nature of which is to pay Mama, that 
is a mitzvah which generates and creates a shibud mom. Now Bezdin is on their own. Forget about Kofi and all the mitzvahs. They will now collect from the shibud mom. But keep in mind that that shibud mom is always contingent on the chiv mitzvah. It's not something that came because I'm holding on to your mama. That's not so. You can't say that someone is holding on to the machsa shekel that belongs to the base hamigdash. You could say that because of the chiv to pay the money, that generates a shibud mom. Now the Mishnah, and this is more or less where we got up to, the Mishnah gives us categories of individuals who are included in this highest level called Memashkin. And you'll notice that the first category on the list is Levim. And when we learned this, whenever we learned it, I guess it was whenever before Purim, who remembers? But I didn't realize that the Mishnah skips a category. Which category should have been mentioned before Levium? Kohanim. Now, it's possible A or B, A, that Kohanim are completely excluded from the mitzvah of Shkolim. But I think more likely, and we're going to develop this in the sugi as we go along, Kohanim are included in the mitzvah of Shkolim, just that they're not included in the din of Mashkinim. We will not, Bezdin will not exercise their rights to collect the Shibud Mamon from the possessions of the Kohanim. And that puts Kohanim on a higher level. Let's call it Maila Asuba Kohanim. We find very often in Shas that we elevate the Kohanim. And the Mamashkinin is a bit of, a, of an insult, of an e covered to the Kohanim. Or in the flip side, you could say that because the Kohanim has reason we him, we, we rely on the Kohanim. Yeshlis Mochalim, they will come forward with their Shkolim. We don't have to embrace this very radical, aggressive approach of taking away their Nechos. Maybe it's a combination of those two. In other words, number one, it's an insult to the Kohanim if we send our troops down, you know, to start carrying out their. Uh, you know, they're refrigerators from their house. And number two, we can rely on the Kohen. But there is a possibility, which I'm throwing out here, that maybe the Mishnah, by deliberately omitting Kohenim, implies that the Kohenim are not included in the Machsa Shekhar. They are part of the base of Mignosh. And the Karbonos, to some extent, are their Karbonos. Again, you can fight me to, tooth and nail on this, but just, just keep it in the back of your mind. Is there a possibility that for the coin to be obligated to pay a masa shekel, it's like it's going from one pocket to the other? Because he himself has rights to the to the to the carbonos. You're buying a carbon with his money. What do you mean? He he has a specific and unique ownership in the carbonos by virtue of the fact that the avoda is incumbent upon his shoulders as a cone. In any event, the bottom line is, we don't know why, and there are a bunch of possibilities here, but the Mishnah omits Kodim and jumps right across the Levine. Now the question is, why is, why is the Mishnah bothering to tell me that the law of Mimashkinim applies after the 25th Adol to the Levim. And the Rush, which I have here, he says that that the Levim themselves, according to one opinion, can only offer the Machzah Shekel on a voluntary basis, they are not obligated in Machzah Shekel. If they want to take it upon themselves, fine. But they're not obligated. And therefore, for sure, there's no Dinah Mamashkin. And there is such a Shita. We'll have to see what, what it's based upon. Our mission is coming. Lafuke says the Rosh. 
that sheet. A second here, sorry. Okay. Now, what I'd like to keep in mind here, as as sort of a background to this whole sugya of who's Chayev in Machta Shekel, is the Kriya that we started reading this week, I mean, we'll read it this Shabbos, of the Pkudim, of the census, Kitisa, Kitisa is Rosh Bnei Yisrael. Because we're going to see that there's a direct connection between the mitzvah of Minyan, Minyan meaning census, and the mitzvah of Machsa Sheker. And the only way we can collect, we can count the people of Israel is through the Matzah HaSheket. We will not count heads. We'll count Shkolim. And the Levium are not counted. The Levium are not included in the law of Minyan. And since it's through the Matzah HaShekel that we set up the Minyan, and th- since the Leviim are not included in the minion, hence they're not included in the Machzah Shekel. That could be the Havamina that Alan Mish is coming La Fuke. Next, Yisraelim, okay, fine. Yisraelim are Chayim on a yearly annual basis to bring forward their Machzah Shekel. And that's a full fledged Chayim with the Din of a with the two Tadim of the Minchaschina, how that operates. But then we have to ask the following question. What is the annual chiyuv? Is it any day of the year? I wake up on, uh, on Tu Bishvat and I decide I'm, I'm coming forward with my machtas hasheka. Well, you know what? It's a New Year's resolution. Right after Rosh Hashanah, the end of Elul, I decide, you know, I'm in the mood to bring my machtas hasheka. To the best of my knowledge, we will accept Machsa Shekel the whole year round. Never refuse a contribution. So if that be the case, then women should be included in the midst of Machsa Shekel because there's no specific date. We may get involved in certain dates as we come to that critical point in which we absolutely need the Machsa Shekel because the new year starts with Rosh Chodesh Nisan as far as Karbanos Hatzibur are concerned. But nevertheless, the whole year is given to Masa Shek. And if that be the case, I just want to lay this down on the table. I don't understand what's coming in around the bend. We're not up to it yet. That Low nosh. That women are not included in this halacha b'mashkin. Maybe it's a halacha b'mashkin, but enochinami the women are obligated. But if we assume that the women are exempt, I don't know why, because the whole year round is good for the mitzvah machzah shek. We will never reject anyone's machzah shek, not by day and not by night. And any mitzvah that's 24-7 and incorporates the entire year is a mitzvah So I'm just telling you why I'm going to be very irritated by what's coming around in the mission. Gerim. Now, why does the Mishnah feel, comp- feel compelled to tell me that a ger is chayv in the mitzvah of Machzah Shekha? What was the Hava meaning that I would exempt a ger? A ger is chayv in all mitzvahs ki Yisrael gomel. And strangely enough, 
Rav Shlomo Surleo, the Rosh Surleo, here on these words, Vigerim ve'avodim ishukhrorim, he writes, Shenemar ve'yichuli truma me'es kol ish. Kol ish, l'rabal says ha'gerim ve'avodim ishukhrorim. Now, by the way, that exact Russia appears in Mesech the Megillah to tell us, to teach us, that Gerim and Avodim Yishukhorim are obligated in the midst of Megillah. But there I understand it very well. Because the midst of Megillah is meant to thank Hashem, Lula, for saving us from the Xer of Haman. And the grandchildren of Haman were not included in the Xer of Haman. And you know, Zagir was not included. Kamash Malan, that it's a chiv on Nikol Yisrael, and it becomes a mitzvah unto itself. And it's not that I'm thanking HaKadosh Baruch Hu through the mitzvah of Megillah for the, my great great ancestors that were spared from Zagir of Haman. It now becomes a chiv. But in the case of Machtas HaShekel, why does the Rash Soleo, and for that matter, it's really a question on the Mishnah. Feel compelled, may ace call ish, afilu gerim, afilu avodim ishukhra. And again, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm in the dark. The only thing I have to figure out is the relationship between the senses and Maxus HaShekel, and perhaps if my ancestors were included in the census where I paid the Maxus HaShekel in order to be counted for the minion at Chichen Ribui, then I understand that a ger might be excluded. And therefore we need a posuk of Kol Ish. But I'm, I'm not I mean, don't quote me on that. I'm, I'm certainly not. I'd rather leave it as a, as a tzorach iyu. Just want to check one or two things, if you don't mind. Just one second. Now, if not for the Rosh Soleo, who quotes a Pasuk in the Parsha of Machzah Shekel, we could have said that the Mishnah is really interested in teaching me an entirely different Allah about Shechur Avod. So this is not going to help me with the Rosh Soleo, but independent of the Rosh Soleo, what happens when I am a shachar my Evid? Does he need Tvila or does he not need Tvila? L'shem Geris. The Ramban Shita is that a, an Evid will begin with a Tvila and end after Shechur with a second Tvila. The Ramban in Mesech the Yavamas holds that a, an Evan needs two Tvilos. The first generates a Chiv Mitzvah's Ke'isha. And then after Shechur, he needs a second Gerus, which means a second Tvila in the Mikvah, in order to upgrade his Chiv Mitzvah's from that of an Isha to that of an Ish. Now, that's very relevant to our discussion here at our Mishnah because the Mishnah says, Avolo Noshin. So why is an Eved included where an Ish is not? And what generates his obligation? But the answer is it's after Shechur. So maybe the Mishnah is teaching us that even before his Tvila B'mikvah, he is a full-fledged Yisrael via or as a result of the 
shichur. The shichur itself, which means when the Adon delivers a get shichur, that is enough to generate a full-fledged Kedusha Yisrael and jump the increment between an Isha, in terms of Chiv Mitzvahs, and an Ish. Is this against the Ramban? I don't know. Could be the Ramban holds that although Lechatchili requires a second Kibila, but nevertheless, he's already considered a, a Ben Yisrael with all the Chiyuvim, the whole Taryag, even before that Tvila. That Tvila, according to the Ramban, is a separate Chova, and it sort of embellishes his full-fledged Kedusha Yisrael with an act of Tvila, but it's not critical. I just want to see if by chance... Any of the commentaries here mention something about a gear. No, so far I'm not finding anything. Um, anything here in the Taklin Kharatim? Let's just see. No, he doesn't say a word. So we're we're on our own here. Okay. Now, what about Nosh? Why do we exclude Nosh? The Meiri says because it's a mitzvah sase shazman gro, which I can't understand. Will accept Shkol the whole year round, twenty four seven. There's not a moment of time which is excluded from Machzis Hashekel. Nor is there a moment of time that splits the Chiv into its various component parts. Meaning Kriyachma, women are exempt from because there's Yom and Laila B'Shal B'Chav Kumech. So we split. The time period, it's not just one flowing time period. Women are obligated to mezuzah because you can't split the time period. It just flows perpetually from the moment you have a bias. So to Maxis HaShekel, although again, we will go through these three stages that we said, Achroz on Rosh Chodesh Adar and Shulchanos on the 15th of Adar, and Mashkinin on the 25th of Adar. That's fine and then. But that doesn't make it in, into a Mitzvah Seishas Man Grama. Mitzvah Seishas Man Grama would be if there was a separate Mitzvah the whole year round, and a separate Mitzvah post Adar. But that's not true for Mitzvah Shek. So you, you don't have any of the possible conditions to check off to make something into Zman Grama. There's no Zman that's Mufka that's excluded from the Mitzvah. For example, Gemara says it's tefillin. Nashim Pturis, why? Because there's no tefillin on Shabbos, according to that man, the Omar. But there's no moment in time. Again, there might be a muksa issue on Shabbos, but there's no moment in time that's excluded from Makta Shekel. So this Me'iri on the side for a moment. And now we're going to introduce the rush. The Rosh says, Noshim, Turos Tichsiv, Vinosnu Ish Kofer Nafsha. This week's parish, Ish, Lafuke Isha. Now, it seems to me that although I don't understand the Meiri at this point, there is a clear-cut nafkemina between the Meiri and the Rosh. The Rosh says that the Pasuk itself, Ish, bumps off the Ish. She's not included in this mitzvah. That's not so according to the Meiri. The Meiri includes her in the mitzvah, but she's part of it. For example, Rabbi Tam, in general, in Mitzvah Seishman Groma, says that a woman can come forward and fulfill the mitzvah voluntarily 
he goes as far as to say that she'll make a bracha if she does so. Hence, Ashkenazic women, because we, you know, Ashkenazios will pass like her baby Pam, will make a bracha on Shofar and a Lulav, all which in Mitzvah mind grow. And Noshim Pturos. So that Mitzvah Seishas Mangrom is not a Hafka. No, no, no. They have that Mitzvah. And they can recite a Sher Kinshon of Mitzvah. So again, the word Mitzimanu is a little problematic according to Rabbeinu Tam. And the Ramam leaves out brachas for women completely. Totally opposed to a woman making a brach on his mind. Grama, she can't say the word Vitzivanu. And Rabbeinu Tam gets over it. And Vitzivanu means I'm part of the Kedushas Yisrael. And that Kedush Yisrael generates the mitzvah in an abstract sense, even though I'm not obligated in that mitzvah. So I can recite Vitzivanu according to Rabbeinu Tam. But definitely, if the Me'iri is learning that women in Shkolim is man grama, they are included in the mitzvah of Shkolim. And for sure, even though we can't force them, they can take it upon themselves optional uh, by option to fulfill this mitzvah of Shkolim. That's so according to the Rosh. The Rosh is saying that when it says in the Pasuk, in Nasnu, which means that we will receive their kofar nefesh. It says, ish. V'nostu ish kofar nefesh. I don't know that, and I doubt, that according to the rush, a woman could take it upon herself voluntarily to fulfill this mitzvah. Now, I want to tell you something which I was absolutely flabbergasted. Very often in my experience, the Me'iri mentions a shita that's way out. I once wrote an article on a sugya called Zaken Mamre in Sanhedrin. And I tried to prove that the Me'iri came up with a shita that's just out to lunch. You know, that you need a unanimous decision and he's cholik on a wild stuff. But when I look in the back of the Masifta, in something called the Yalkut Habiurim, to my astonishment, I find out that this sheet in the Meiri is not some sort of far flung sheet. He quotes, for example, the Shar HaMelech. Okay, it's an Achron, the very early Achron, who writes, that Lechora, the well, let's go even earlier. I, let me get the chronological order here. He starts with the Maram Shik, who writes, Shaptur, whom he shumits, says, man, grow. Not just, I promise you, the Maram Shik was not aware of the Meir. He came up with it on his own. And the Sharamelech, who's a super commentary on the Rambam, quotes our Mishnah as a shlaga to contest against the Shara, the Mishnah Lamelech. There's a world classic Mishnah Lamelech with regard to Zman Groma, in which the Mishnah Lamelech claims that an Eved is only excluded from a mitzvah if it's a Zman Grom. And the Mishnah Melch says that there are two categories of Pturim, of exemptions for women. One is Zman Groma, and the other is other Pturim, which are derived from Sukim and have nothing to do with Zman Grom. And an Eved has the status of an Isha, liftar es atmo mi mitzvis, but only if it's man groma. If it's not man groma, then even if a woman is exempt from that mitzvah, but if it has nothing to do with man groma, if it's a special reason that applies to a woman, we don't extend it to an Evan. It's not that the Kedushas Yisrael of an Evan is identical with that of an Isha vis-a-vis of mitzvahs. No. 
There's a separate p'tur of Zman Grova that applies to Eved when it applies to Isha. And that's what we derive from the Xerish of to equate an Eved with an Isha. Says the Sharmelech, what is our good friend, the Mishnah Melch, going to do with our Mishnah here in Shkolin? Because if a woman is exempt from Shkolin because it says Ish, Ish below Isha, that has no impact on an Evet. And yet, our Mishnah says, Noshim ve'avodim, does it not? Why is an Evet potter from Masis HaShekel, according to the Mishnah Lamella? Just because it says in the Pasuk, Ish? Ish doesn't exclude Isha. And according to the Mishnah Lamella, there are many mitzvahs which an Evet is obligated in, where an Isha is exempt from. There's a whole issue, for example, about Talmud Torah. Talmud Torah is not a Mitzvah Sasechus Man Grom. It's 24-7. There's no moment in time that's excluded. Whatever you do on Christmas Eve, I don't care. But there's a, 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 Talmud Torah is 24-7, seven days a week, 12 months out of the year. But it says, V'shinan tom l'vanecha, v'anecha v'lo b'nosecha. That doesn't apply to an Evet. So an Evid, therefore, according to the Mishnah Melch, would be obligated to the Mitzvah of Talmud Torah. But there are many, many examples. There are many Isurim that apply to an Evid that don't apply to an Isha, which have nothing to do with Zman Grova. And therefore, it's not included, according to the Mishnah Melch, within the purview of La La Meish. And now, says the Shara Melech, we should take the Mitzvah of Shkolim and put it into that very category of a Mitzvah where women are exempt by virtue of a special Pasuk, but it's not a mitzvah that says Shazman Grom. And it would seem, therefore, according to our mathematical calculations, that the Mishnah of Melch has no choice but to accept the shita that we attribute to the Meiri, but it's also the shita of the Maram Shik, at mitzvah's shkolim is a mitzvah that says Shazman Grom. So the Aruch HaShulchan comes up with a wild idea. He says that although the shekel itself is not Zman Grama, but Kapara is Zman Grama. You know, I, I, you know, I tip my hat to the creativity of the Aruch HaShulchan, but I have problems with it. But, but listen to the creative idea. He says that the Torah says that receive the Masa Shechel as a kofer nefesh. There's a loch in kapara that ain kapara el bayom velo balayla. A gemar in erchen on daf yudalf. And says the Aruch HaShulch, and I'll prove it to you. Gemar in erchen on daf yudalf establishes that ain't a frosh ashkol and belayla. The hairs of my sir, I both say. This is, this, to me, this is all brand new. I mean, you're old hats, but I'm sorry. I, to me, this, I never knew this. That A equals B and B equals C. That A is shkol and equals B is kapara. B, there's no kapara belayla only by yom. And therefore, D is no ha frosh ashkol and belayla. It's only by yom. My gosh, this sheds a whole new light on the Meiri. How could the Meiri even entertain the idea that Shkolim is a mitzvah seishas man groma? Is there one moment of time where there's no afrash Shkolim? Says the Yarchashulch, yes, there's no afrash Shkolim in Lila. Women are exempt from tzitzis because there's no tzitzis for Lila, according to that mandiom. And Tfilin, according to one cheetah, we had it, I think, in the Gemara and Arafin. Is there's no tefillin belayla? Even if I hold this tefillin b'shabes, but there's no tefillin belayla. Women are exempt. So any mitzvah hayom that excludes layla becomes, by definition, man grama. And now the archashulch wants to take machta shekel and place it under that category. It's yom v'lolai. It's wild because I'll tell you the truth. 
if I didn't have this proof for the Archa Shulchan, I would say, okay, it's very nice that when they took the census and they collected the Masa Shekel, it was a Kofer Nefesh. The, the Pesach says, well, you Negev Bifkodosov. Somehow the Masa Shekel prevented them because if they were to count it by head, there would be a Negev. Therefore, I derive halachic conclusions about the mitzvah, and I circumscribe the mitzvah of Maksa Shekel based on the fact that the Torah calls a Kofra Nefesh. But the Archa Shulchan has a Gemara in Erech. In er. This is brand new. I wanted to suggest, because I didn't know about this Archa Shulchan, that perhaps the machlokis here between, if we'll call it the Meiri Viseyoso and the Rosh Viseyoso, about whether or not Shkolem is Van Groma, depends upon a different question. How to define Zman Groma? Does Zman Groma depend upon the Chiyuv HaMitzvah or the Kiyuv HaMitzvah? The Kiyuv HaMitzvah of Shkolem is from Rosh Chodesh Adar. That's when we notify the people, bring forth Yishkalim. In Ochinami, the Chiyu is the whole year, but the Kiyu Mitzvah is during a specific period of time. But I threw it out. I was not happy with this because the Kiyu Mitzvah is the whole year round as well. The active pursuit and pressure that Bezdin is going to place on the people to come forward to that shkolem, that's time limited. But the mitzvah per se, even in terms of the kiyuma mitzvah, is not limited. And if I come forward on some gedalia with my shkolem, Bezdin will accept my shkolem, and I'll make my bracha, and I'll be mafresh my shkolem. So I came up with a, a different idea. What is man grum? Two possibilities. One possibility is a perpetual mitzvah, meaning, I'm sorry, what's lows man grum? Means it's a perpetual mitzvah. And there's no time that's mufka that's excluded from that mitzvah. Another definition is. That Zman is Machai of the Mitzvah. So, for example, give me just your, again, you know, on Zoom, this is very hard to do, but if, if, if you would give me your knee jerk reaction to the following question Philo, is it Zman Grom or is it not? Is there a moment in time which is excluded from Philo? What would you say? And if anybody wants to turn on their this or. Uh, I think you can do it. I, uh, I didn't. I didn't touch any buttons here. So you. What would you say, Tfilo? I mean, is is there? Again, on a drabona level, I understand you have to daven three times a day and this one chak. But let's leave that out. I want to go back to the do rice. Is there a moment in time when I'm not, I'm not capable or it's impossible halachically to fulfill tefillah? I wake up in the middle of the night. You know, I say, There's no such thing. No, there's no time excluded. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. But I have a different definition of Zman Grom. The Zman is Machai. True, it's a constant mitzvah, but they each unit of time generates its own mitzvah. For example, answer this question. Is there a moment of time which is excluded from Kriyachma? Okay, so you have to know more about Pachobach of Kumech. But let's say I would tell you that with the Raisa, there is such Shita, the entire night is suitable for Kriyachma Shal Arvis, and the entire day is suitable for Kriyachma Shal A hypothetical possibility. Would that make it into Lav's mind Groma? Maybe, because there's no time period that's Mufka. 
But on the other hand, Yom generates its mitzvah and Lila generates its mitzvah. Let's go back to Tefillah. The Ramah opens up Hilfus Tefillah and he says, Mitzvah saseil is pala b'chol yom. Now what I understand from the Ramah is that every day generates its own chiv of tefillah. The Gemara has a new svara why women are obligated in tefillah. This is in Brachos Tafchav. Tefillah rachmei ninu. But, but again, I don't want to get into that question. What does rachmei ninu mean? But in the absence of rachmei ninu, the Gemara seems to assume that women would be exempt from tefillah. Why? In the light of this Rambam, perhaps, with a redefinition of Zman Groma, we can ex- explain it. Because mitzvah is pal b'chol yom. Every day is a unit of time that engenders its own unique independent chiv of this mitzvah of tefillah. And if not for the super svara that the Gemara comes up with of tefillah rachmei women would be exempt from tefillah, as mind-boggling as that sounds. Perhaps. Machtes shekel. The year itself is your unit of time. Why? Because every year we need to collect a new collection of Machsa Shekel. Last year is not going to count for this year. And you want to give a down payment this year for next year? You're not fulfilling the mitzvah. Because we have to collect the money and buy the Korban Sitzibur from this year's Shkolan. And that means that just like in the Rambam, the way we said it in Tfilo, that the yom is machayer in tefillah. Every yom has a separate entity. So there's this man element in the mitzvah. It's not like mezuzah, which is constant, and there's no zman element whatsoever. So too, in matzah shekel, according to the Meiri, there's a zman element in the mitzvah. And what zman engenders the mitzvah and sets up bookmarks, beginning, end, that's the year, not the day, but the year. And every year is a separate machai. So what does the rush hold? Because he, he doesn't have Zman Groma with regard to Shkol. So one possibility is to say that as long as there's no Zman that's Mufka from the Kivim Mitzvah, he would hold that it's a mitzvah say she has man grama would include women and therefore he rejects the miri. And maybe he would reject the Rama. And you cannot subsume fila as man grama because of the day, because there's no mufka, there's no, no zman mufka for the mitzvah. But I would like to suggest an alternative approach as to why the rush rejects the miri and refuses to categorize shkol and as man grama. And that is because the rush holds that it's not a din that the Zman itself engenders the mitzvah. It's not like tefillah. Tefillah means that there's a unit of time that generates the mitzvah. There's a time element in tefillah. There's no time element in matzah shekel. It's true that every year we need a new matzah shekel. And therefore the chiyuv emerges with each year. But not because there's this man element that's in, in, inherent in the mitzvah, intrinsic to the mitzvah. It's not right to say that the, the, the year itself engenders the mitzvah. Because there's no difference between the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, the end of the year. It's not like tefillah, where yesterday's tefillah has no impact on today. When I bring Maksa Shekel yesterday, I fulfill the mitzvah today as well. There's no time element inherent in the mitzvah. Not the way the Me'iri, the way we that each year is a separate entity. No, 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 no. The Zman Groma would be if what I did before is not relevant to what I did now. We bifurcate, we split amongst the Zmanim. There's no splitting of Zmanim in Shkola. 
you know the joke, uh, it's a facetious joke. There's some groups, I don't want to mention any names, that are very loose and lenient about Zmane at Fila. So the guy comes into the minion. So he says, what are you davening? We're davening Mincha. Yeah, is it today's Mincha or yesterday's Mincha? You know, that, that's the joke. It means that every day is a separate chiyuv. The fact that I daven yesterday is irrelevant till today. But that's not true in the case of Shkolin. Shkolin keeps flowing. Again, I need a new shekel. So the mitzvah is to, to, to bring Shkolin chadoshim. Every year we'll define Shkolin chadoshim as far as the Chumas Alishka and the Afroshas Okay, let's go on. Uktanim. Okay, the Mishnah says that there's a new aloha, brand new aloha. I don't know if it has any parallel throughout the Tariq Mitzvahs, a new definition of katan with regard to shkol. Anyone who's less than 20 years old, now stay saras, he's past bar mitzvah, he's high in all mitzvahs, he's potter. From the mitzvah of Shkol. And to quote the language of the Rashbash, again, we'll see it in the Gemara pretty clearly. He says, Again, this week's parsha. Again, you could have said that maybe that's a separate aloha in minion. You know, when we count, we take a census of males who are above 20. But you see that we're operating with a tlut, an interdependence between the mitzvah of matzah shekel and the halacha of mitzvah's minion. And we count ben esrim for mala, and therefore only a ben esrim for mala's chayv in shko. Now the mission is going to continue with chinuch. And the mission is going to ask, what happens if the father brings the shkolim on behalf of his son, even before his son is 20? Does that generate a chiyuv upon the father that henceforth, on an annual basis, he has to continue to bring the shkolim on behalf of his son? But I would ask a, a, I would ask a, a more preliminary question. Forget about Chino for a moment. is the status of a young male, a Jewish boy who's above 13, but he's less than 20? What's his status vis-a-vis Shkolim? Are we saying that he doesn't need the shekel, so to speak, because the purpose of the shekel is to give him a kapara when we count the people of Israel, or a protection, if you will, he doesn't need that protection because he is protected anyway. He has his own antibodies because he's not counted. Or should we say no? He's excluded from the mitzvah. The first interpretation is that he's really included in the mitzvah because he's high in all mitzvahs. Narvas, he doesn't need the mitzvah. So we can't force him to come off and cough, cough up the shkolim when he doesn't need it. And the Torah makes that connection between forcing a person to come forward with his shekel and protecting him. He doesn't need the protection. But he's included in the mitzvah. He's a bar mitzvah for all other mitzvahs. He's chayv in tefillin and lulav and in shofar and in Shabbos. He's also chayv in shkolim. Or no. The Torah is saying, that if you're not included in the census, then you're not included at all in the mitzvah. You're not even chayav in the mitzvah of Shkol. You're completely moved. 
And the nafkamin is going to be how I interpret the word katan in the next sentence in the mission. The chol katan shehiskil aviv lishkol al yado shuv eno posik. What does that word katan mean? Does it mean the katan of Max shekel, or does it mean the katan of kolator kula? We're talking now about the mitzvah chinuch. The mitzvah chinuch applies to a katan who's less than bar mitzvah. In the case of a young boy who is past bar mitzvah, but he's less than 20, I'm not sure if there's a mitzvah chinuch. And the reason for that is because it's up to the young man himself. He has to make his decision if he wants to fulfill the mitzvah of shkol. We can't force him, but he'd be encouraged and recommended to come forward with that mitzvah and, and achieve a kiyuma mitzvah. That's not a chino. The word cotton in this mission means that he's a classic cotton for the mitzvah chino. And he's less than 13. If, let's say, for whatever reason, the bar mitzvah young lad decides he doesn't want to participate in the shkola, he's not included in the pasuk that says, kola over because he's not me ben esrim v'mal. And therefore, the end of the pasuk, he takes Hashem, doesn't apply. He tells you, go fly, kite. I'm not. I'm not coughing up a machta shekel. I'm saving my money to buy a beautiful new bicycle. I'm not going to give to the machta shekel. So the father says, you know what? Don't worry. I'll cover it. On me. Writes out a check for machta shekel. Does that obligate the father for the next seven years, you know, to bring a machta shekel on behalf of his son? I don't know. Could be. That the word cut on here means that he is a, a classic cut, that he's less than bar mitzvah. And the father has already picked up the mitzvah of chinuch. Once having done so, he is committed for the balance of the child, again, not such a child, I mean, until he's 20, of that period of time in his, in his youth. And the father is obligated in, in that mitzvah of chinuch, or no. We're only talking about the mitzvah of chinuch up until the bar mitzvah age of all mitzvahs. Now, Again, there's no there's no apparent commentary here on on why the father is. We have a general rule, you know, if you fulfill a mitzvah, <coughs> excuse me, three times over, it becomes like a med. Is that what the Mishnah has in mind? It says hischil aviv. I don't know. Hischil aviv means. One time, that's how I interpret the word hiskil, no? It sounds like we're talking about a unique halacha here. It's not neder, but yet he, <clears throat> in the Rambam's language here, in Pirush HaMishnayis, the Rambam says, Im aviv nosan bavuro koton we say to the father, me'ata shena, me'achso shena sato lo b'shona sh'avra, Hematical love, Zosa Mitzvah, is Taino of Tamid, Achiyadil Velotifsa. I don't know. It doesn't sound like it's a bit of Neder. It sounds like the, the Nesina of the Father on one occasion generates a Chiyuv. That will take us until the boy is the young man is 20 years old. He writes here again, it's the same Rama just in English. In, in, in having voluntarily taken upon himself this mitzvah performance, the father should not stop until the son reaches maturity. But why is that so? 
I mean, that's not a look in mitzvahs in general. He didn't do it three times over. He goes ahead and he says that we can even confiscate the father's property vis-a-vis -vis that uh, mitzvah that he started giving on behalf of his son up until the age of 20. That's really wild. That's the Meiri. Rabbeinu Meshulam maintains that the father's giving is only a meritorious act, but is not an absolute duty, meaning we cannot seize his property if he fails to live up to this pledge. So Belin Eder, I, I see we're running out of time here. We'll try to pick this up tomorrow. And maybe we can get more of an insight into why the father became obligated, or maybe it's not an obligation, and the machlokas between the Me'iri and Rabbeinu Meshulam as to whether or not the Allah of, of Memashkinin will apply in the case of a father who started giving the matzah shekel on behalf of his son. Okay then, so thank you everyone. You should have a great day and uh, we're trying to make some progress here.